Hello everybody, welcome back to Mega Projects. This one, the Akrano plan. This one, uh, I really thought when I saw this, and you see that you've probably seen images of this on YouTube, and you think, ah, oh, it's definitely a clickbait thumbnail. They never made that thing. They totally did. And so I can have a clickbait thumbnail that is, well, it's sort of clickbait, but it actually delivers. Because this is the Akrano plan, which is an incredible, it's technically a ground effect vehicle. It's super interesting. I'd never even heard of ground effect vehicles before, so, I found learning about this super interesting and I hope you guys do as well and let's just jump in. Oh and also of course smash that like button. Out of the depths of the Cold War, a monster emerged. While photographing parts of the Soviet Union, an early US reconnaissance drone took an image that baffled Western intelligence. The bizarre Soviet contraption sat on the shores of the Caspian Sea was unlike anything seen before. At first glance, it resembled an enormous airplane, but its wing was far too short for its size. To add to the mystery, <laughs> you imagine they're like, ah, Soviets can't even build a plane. Those wings are far too short. To add to the mystery, whatever it was carried the insignia of the Soviet Navy, not the Air Force. Just two letters could be seen on its fuselage, KM. Unsure what it was, US intelligence used the letters to give it a nickname, Caspian Monster, which over time morphed into the Caspian Sea Monster. Bizarre is perhaps the best word to start a video about the Akrana plan. What was first glimpsed by the West, at least, in 1967 was an early prototype of a ground effect vehicle called the Karabel Machets, or KM, which means prototype in Russian. This experimental aircraft soon came to be known as the Akrana Plan. The tale of this early Soviet Akrana Plan and its successes is one of secrecy and one we still don't know a huge amount about today, but we've done our best here at Mega Projects to dig up stuff and make, well, a 20 minute video about it. This vehicle was a fascinating foray into an unproven technology, which even today is rarely used. Lying somewhere between a plane, a boat, and a hovercraft, it remains one of the strangest pieces of engineering to come out of the Cold War. And it was the Cold War, so that's really saying something. But what on earth is a ground effect vehicle? It's kind of easy to just say that the Akrana plan is a flying boat, but it's just not right. This metallic Leviathan was, in fact, a ground effect vehicle, or GEV. GEVs are designed to fly close to the ground, or more usually, to water, using the aerodynamic drag created when aircraft wings are close to a solid object. This is known as the ground effect, or sometimes the wing in ground effect. In very basic terms, the GEV would sit on a cushion of trapped air between the wings and the water. This was designed to offer the speed of an aircraft with the capacity of a small to medium-sized ship while being neither an aircraft nor a ship. Confused? <laughs> GVs generally can only fly as high as 20 meters, 65 feet, otherwise the ground effect is lost. But normally, they would fly much closer to the ground, to the point that it looks like the GV is skimming the surface of the water. In theory, this meant around half the fuel consumption of regular aircraft, while being able to carry twice as much. In terms of shipping, it couldn't match the capacity, but it certainly could provide greater speeds than any ship at the time. Or surely any ship today. There aren't any ships that travel as fast as planes. However, it came with several disadvantages. Flying low over land or water greatly increased the chances of a collision, with pilots commenting on fatigue from constantly scanning the area ahead. Further, taking off from water in high winds would batter the bottom of the GEV and test its structural capability to the limit. Anyway, ground effect had first been noticed as early as the 1920s, when pilots commented that their planes operated more efficiently when close to the ground. In 1934, the US National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics released a paper titled Ground Effect on the takeoff and landing of aeroplanes. In it, a Frenchman by the name of Maurice Lesseur gave the first tentative ideas for a GEV, a means of rapid and, at the same time, economic locomotion. Things didn't get going until the 1960s when the Soviets and Americans both began developing the technology. The Soviet endeavor was led by Rostislav Alexiev, one of the leading figures in the development of the hydrofoil, while in the United States a German named Alexander Lipisch was placed in charge. But if you're expecting some kind of cold War showdown. Well, you're gonna be a bit disappointed in this video, but don't worry. Mega projects, we definitely cover those. So, just watch one of our other videos about Cold War technology. 
for more of that. While both the US and the Soviet Union began experimenting with GEVs during the 1960s, it was the Soviets that sprinted ahead. The US did complete the Collins X112 GEV in 1963, and despite it receiving entirely satisfactory test results, it seems the project just stalled there. This may have been because the US had a significant advantage over the Soviets in terms of its navy at this point, and it just didn't feel that it was necessary to pursue it further, but we just don't know for sure. This particular Cold War decision just seems to be lost to history. When images of the Soviet KM emerged, Western intelligence had absolutely no idea what they were looking at, partly because the technology was still in its relative infancy in the US. You see, this was just a race that was over before it had even started. The development of a GEV in the USSR took place at the Soviet Central Hydrofoil Design Bureau. Led by Alexiev, the project soon attracted the attention of Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, who believed that the KM could be the answer to the mighty aircraft carriers of the United States. And I know what you might now be thinking, you're thinking, well, how can a KM possibly hope to match an aircraft carrier? It's kind of a totally different thing. Well, the thing is, it wasn't really designed to be a direct challenger, but rather something completely unique and something else that could challenge the US on the seas just in a different way. It was seen as a potential way to transfer large amounts of troops at a high speed and a low altitude. The low altitude means that it would also be undetectable to radar, pretty important stuff. Another option would be to use them as mobile missile launchers, which could be deployed rapidly around the world. Either way, if it worked, it could add some serious weight to Soviet amphibious capabilities, an area in which it had constantly lagged behind the United States. Funds were made available for prototypes in the top secret program, codenamed Steamboat, got underway. Khrushchev later made the teasing and quite misleading boast to the international media that the USSR had boats that could jump over bridges. And we're just going to assume that he was joking because he didn't. They couldn't do that. After two years of construction and several small manned and unmanned attempts, what came to be known as the Caspian Sea Monster emerged in 1966. At the time, this was the largest aircraft in the world with a length of 92 meters, but a wingspan of just 37.6 meters. That's 16 meters longer than a 747 airliner while having a wingspan of nearly half the size. And as we mentioned before, it looks really strange. Excellent clickbait material. The KM had a maximum takeoff weight of 500 144 tons with a capacity large enough for 50 people inside, but it could only reach a mighty altitude of 5 to 10 meters. During testing, it was recorded to have a cruising speed of 267 miles per hour and a maximum operational speed of 311 miles per hour. Now, remember, this wasn't really a boat or a plane, and its top speed falls somewhere between the two. It was considerably slower than a modern conventional aircraft, about 259 miles per hour slower than a 747, but considerably faster than the fastest ship ever built, the Francisco, a ferry operator between Buenos Aires and Montevideo in Uruguay, which can travel at 58.1 knots, making the KM just over four and a half times faster than the record-breaking ship. It was powered by eight Dobrinin VD7 turbo engines mounted at the front and a further two at the back. Interestingly, the exhausts of the front engines were directed down at such an angle that it provided the tail wings with an extra cushion of air to ride upon. So, not a plane, not really a boat either, but rather tellingly, a bottle of champagne was smashed against its nose before it made its maiden voyage a tradition associated with boats, but not with planes. The Akrana plane's first flight took place on the 16th of October 1966 in the Caspian Sea, with Rostislav Alexiev himself in the cockpit. From what we know about the 50-minute test flight, it was a total success, and, well, the stage was surely set for the age of the Akrana plane, right? Or, well, you might be thinking that. Two years before Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev had been removed from office and replaced by Leonid Brezhnev, a man with far less interest in experimental GEV mechanics than his predecessor. Rostislav Alexeyev and his colleagues tried personally to push the benefits that a fleet of Akranoplanes would bring, but they failed. If you believe the story, the only comment Brezhnev made after the presentation was about his upcoming lunch. Alexiev's dreams seemed dead in the water, though he was given the go-ahead to build a smaller version, which we'll be coming to in a moment. Now, we don't know much about what happens with the KM over the next 14 years, as almost none of the official information regarding the project has ever been released. But 1980 would bring the deaths of not just the plane's creator, but the KM itself. On the 14th of January 1980, Alexiev was injured in an air crash during a test for an Akrana plane which was to be presented at the 1980 Summer Olympics in Moscow. After two operations, he died on the 9th of February. Ten months later, his proudest creation also met its end. 
On the 15th of December 1980, the KM took off for what was supposed to be just a routine test flight. By this point, it was in poor condition and the years of neglect had begun to take hold. The pilot that day attempted to take off without reaching the speed needed and the KM smashed out of control into the water. While no lives were lost, it is perhaps telling that very little effort was made to recover the damaged plane as it floated in the water for a week before it finally sank. To this day, the one and only KM ever built lies at the bottom of the Caspian Sea. Either the Soviets knew that the KM wasn't worth salvaging, or they had considerably more faith in what was coming next. Only one Lund-class Akranoplane was ever constructed, though a second was cancelled in the final phases of production, and we'll get into that particular plane in just a bit. The Lund-class, nicknamed the Aircraft Carrier Killer, shared many of the hallmarks of the early KM, but also plenty of differences. Measuring 73.8 meters, it was just under 20 meters shorter than the KM. However, with a wingspan of 44 meters, it was just over 6 meters wider than the earlier Akranoplane. The Lund-class was powered by eight Kuznetsov NK-87 turbojet engines, each producing 28,600 pound-force of thrust for a total of 228,000 pound-force of thrust, which is fairly close to a modern 747, which produces about 252,000. This power produced a top speed of 342 miles per hour, now nearly six times the speed of the fastest ship in the world, which we mentioned earlier. It came with a range of some 1,200 miles, roughly the distance between London and Rome. Hypothetically, if traveling at top speed the whole way, it was a distance the Lung class Akranoplane could cover in about three and a half hours, around 50 minutes longer than a passenger aircraft can do it in. But its service ceiling of five meters meant that the journey would be very, very tricky. You'd definitely have to go around the land. <laughs> Another way that it differed from the KM was the weaponry carried on board, as it came with a small arsenal of P-270 Mosquit mosquito-guided missiles. Six missile launchers were mounted on its fuselage with an additional four gun turrets, each with twin-barreled 23mm autocannons. Theoretically, it could have approached an aircraft carrier below radar detection and fired its missiles before anybody knew what was happening. It carried a total of 15 crew on board, six officers and nine enlisted men, and had a capacity of 100 tons, enough to squeeze a blue whale in inside. The one and only Lung class Akranoplane was the MD-160, which entered service with the Black Sea Fleet in 1987, and unfortunately, well, that's about all we know about this craft, except that it was retired sometime in the late 1990s and now sits at a Russian port in the Caspian Sea. The Spasatel had the disadvantage of simply being born at exactly the wrong time. The second Lung class Akranoplane was originally designed as a missile carrier, but after the Soviet nuclear submarine K-278 sank in 1989, killing 42 people, authorities believed the Akranoplane would be better suited to maritime search and rescue missions. Designs were changed and it came agonizingly close to seeing the light of day. But then came along the disintegration of the Soviet Union, which left a lot of projects in limbo. A vast aircraft carrier that would one day be sold to the Chinese and become the Liaoning was abandoned during construction and it was 68% complete. The speed at which things collapsed meant that many military projects just ceased and the Spazatel was one such victim. As the USSR came tumbling down, the Spazatel was 98% finished. Now it's difficult to imagine something just being left at this stage, but that's exactly what happened. As the Akranoplane manufacturing plant went into bankruptcy, the Spazatel and everything else was left exactly as it was. But this has created a rather nice ending to the story, albeit one that's still ongoing. The almost complete Spazatel currently sits in a warehouse in Nizhny Novgorod in western Russia, while the team of volunteers attempt to add the finishing touches to it. This group includes those who once worked on the Akranoplane program, as well as fans and advocates determined to complete this unfinished monster. The project isn't supported by the Russian government, meaning the procurement of parts is incredibly difficult. It's unlikely that the Spazatel will ever fly, but you've got to give it to this group for at least giving it a go. GEV technology remains one of engineering's great enigmas. Since the 1980s, scores of countries have seen small GEVs emerge. The US, Germany, South Korea, Japan, and China, to name just a few, have all produced vehicles used for civilian purposes. Larger models have regularly been designed, but for whatever reason, they just never come to fruition. In the last 10 years, there has been a revival of such, with Singapore, South Korea, Iran, and most recently Estonia testing and building successful GEVs. But anything today, it just pales in comparison to the Caspian Sea monster. 
But that might change one day. In 2002, at the Farnborough International Air Show, Boeing announced a truly extraordinary GEV concept it had been working on. If built, the Pelican would have become the largest plane in history, with an astonishing proposed length of 122 meters and a wingspan of 152 meters. Sadly, things have gone very quiet on this front, with Boeing now focused on low-cost and environmentally efficient passenger planes instead. It is believed that the entire development of the Pelican has now ended, but you never know. The Russians themselves are reportedly in the final phases of development of the Chaika A050, a GEV which looks set to appear in the next few years and will be able to carry 100 people. But like many GEV concepts floating around, it's a case of we'll believe it when we see it. Like much of what was constructed during the Cold War, the earlier Kraner plane was all about size. But the world's changed, and like the mighty Russian Typhoon submarines and perhaps even the gigantic American aircraft carriers, something of that size may struggle to find its place in the 21st century. In the coming decades, we will likely see small GEVs used as ferries, but it's unlikely the Caspian Sea Monster or one of its descendants will ever emerge again. It is a tantalizing idea, but just like the KM lodged in the murky depths of the Caspian Sea, it may never see the light of day again. So I really hope you enjoyed today's Mega Projects video. I never really had even heard of ground effect vehicles before, and to know that they are some technology that we're just not using properly, or you know, it's not quite efficient, or just never got out of development is super interesting. I hope you found it interesting too. Smash that like button if you did. Leave me a comment below if you'd like to see me make a specific Mega Project. Hit up the comments below, vote up the ones you like, and uh, well, hopefully I'll make them. And with that said, thank you for watching.